and welcome to this edition of Inside Tacoma. I'm your host, Randall Lewis. Our guest for our conversation today, State Senator Jeannie Darniel. Welcome back. Nice to be back. And gee, it's good to see you. And it's- And I'm smiling. You're smiling <laughs> and uh, let's see what happened. Oh, the legislature ended on time. On time, 60 days. Wow. That's the first time in what, five years? Oh, at least. At least yes. five years, okay. I think, yeah. Okay. So, and it seemed like a fairly productive session. 300 bills passed the legislature in 60 days. You think we had something to do? <laughs> yeah, you we seemed like you were busy. A lot of built up energy. I think, yeah, I think there was some, uh, now it's the first time in, with democratic control of the whole legislature mm -hmm. um, in five years. And so there seemed to be like some pent up democratic bills that had never got out of the Senate before that suddenly came out. You might recall out. that I ran for a Senate seat in 2012. Right. And um, so when I got into the legislature, um, or after I was elected, it was uh, in the Democratic control at that time. But by the time I actually was sworn in, two members had gone to the other side and so up uplifted the majority and took it away. And uh, so I have been waiting for five years now. This is my sixth year in the Senate, and I had a lot of good bills. That I <laughs> and I was just one of many. Now you had been chair of committees for several years in the House, and then you came to the, the Senate expecting to be in the majority, and you weren't. It's not. So now you can tell us, I've heard this story many times, the difference between the ranking minority member on a committee and being the chair of the committee is a lot bigger than just the name sounds, isn't it? <laughs> yes, I discovered uh, that big change. There's an incredible amount of planning that you have to do, and um, you have a big, big staff that you work with now that, that uh, um, also, in our case, in the Human Services and Corrections Committee, we had a lot of new staff as well on uh, all around us. So, uh, But, you know, in terms of the actual management of the committee, we tried to do that in our committee on a bipartisan basis. So Senator O'Ban and I really in terms of how it worked it could have been me chairing the committee or it could have been him chairing the committee or we heard every bill that came to us uh, with only a couple of exceptions of so we we pretty much operated in a in a comparable style and um, and that meant that we got a lot of good bills out well, I, I see that, and, and I think that's good for the folks here in Tacoma and Pierce County, where Senator Oban is from the 28th district, which represents a portion of Tacoma. You have a much larger portion of Tacoma. And I, it must have been good, because you posed with him on a Facebook post at one point during the session about how well you were working together. That's kind of an unusual thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I have to keep telling people that, that it's authentic, um, that um, that committee, prior to our coming, even into the Senate, either of us, uh, had a long history of being a bipartisan approach to uh, the issues of the day, which is putting people first, dealing with the facts that we have uh, a lot of state-raised kids through in foster care and in our juvenile justice system, uh, kids with mental health problems, families with a lot of dynamics that, that needed to be addressed to, for the safety of children. Uh, so who's not concerned about those issues. Both parties are concerned about it. So so that bipartisan approach we wanted to celebrate in part because it wasn't happening anywhere else <laughs> in the Senate. But but I think it's a good model for all of them to have. But but ours uh, dealing so closely with, with the needs of people in, in challenging situations uh, really um, you know if if we couldn't pull it together then we couldn't pass good legislation to affect those folks. Right now, the legislature has been under court order for a while, at least two uh, court orders uh, for some failures to fund things adequately. Mm -hmm. uh, the state Supreme Court said you had not fulfilled the state's paramount duty, uh, which is K-12 education. Right. And uh, the legislature has tried over several years towards fixing that. And now I keep reading that the legislature believes it's done that now, that you've taken care of, you've checked all the boxes that the Supreme Court said, and uh, now you can move on. Uh, and the other one was mental health. So let's start with education, because that's been in the news way more than the mental health issue has been. Do you really believe, yep, we've done this one now, we can move on? No, I think, I think we've done phase two, and I think we have at least one more phase left to do, uh, and that'll be dealing with the levy, the levy uh, balance um, so that we can really not put a district like Tacoma at risk for losing 
uh, losing support that they de desperately need. And I think the issue of special education funding across the state will come back to, to be worked on next year. All right. You think this, it's hard to predict what a court might do, but you think the court will retain jurisdiction and keep? No, I, I hope, I'm hopeful okay. that this would just be the natural progression and we wouldn't have to be held, you know, in, in contempt uh, for lack of trying. I mean, we really uh, use that as this, the focal point of the, the 60 day session was doing as much as we could to address the McCleary decision, which was the court, court order. Right. Now, those of us who remember our, our civics classes remember that the governments in the United States have three co-equal branches, the executive, the legislative, and the, and the judicial. Uh, and what I noticed this time was there wasn't so much public grousing from the legislative branch about those courts telling us what to do. Uh, we've seen a lot of that in the, in the past, and I've sometimes wondered if that's why the legislature struggled to get to the point it got to this year in the past, because there were just... People saying they can't tell Randy, us what to do. Randy, 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 Randy. We had a recession. <laughs> we had no money. Well, we there were is cutting, that. We were cutting programs right and left, and uh, to save education. But it wasn't enough. We had a, uh, a growing population. We had higher needs. We had the court breathing down our neck, and they made a decision, and we had to respond to it before the recession was was finished. Well, this year we come into the session with some money. Right. We had higher tax revenues. We had lower caseloads. So we were able to not just um, decide the mechanics of how we moved forward, but we actually had the money to be able to do that. So it's what we have known all along with the McCleary decision. You know, it's not as though we had an ideological difference with the court. Every single legislator there knows it's our primary duty, understands that an uneducated kid becomes, you know, potentially part of the challenges we face later on in, in their lives if we can't provide them the educational opportunities that they need. So nobody disagrees with where the court was headed. We just didn't have the money to do it. Well, that, that's certainly the, that's certainly true, and I don't mean to dis, dismiss that as a real issue. But I didn't even see bills that would, you know, make Supreme Court justices get elected from districts or hear any Facebook quotes or tweeter, tweets about the court can go pound sand, things that have happened in previous sessions. Uh, so I, it but, seemed like but, people got past that, and maybe the money being there was what helped make that happen. Well, I, I, that's, that's helped, but also... Quite frankly, you're talking about people jumping up to a bully pulpit, and uh, they had the power to do that because in the Senate, the, the Republicans had control. And so that's where you heard those messages. That's where they uh, espoused them, was, was in their leadership meetings with the press. So, or their statements as, as chairs of committee, you know, uh, committees like the Law and Justice Committee. So uh, when the Democrats took control, those voices were uh, not as, they didn't have much opportunity to be at that bully pulpit. Okay. Now the other issue was mental health, where the court, again, said this, the legislature wasn't funding that adequately. There were some issues with the facilities and staffing at those facilities. It, this one's a little harder to explain than, than K-12, mm -hmm. um, because there's so many different places that the state interacts with the mental health system. So what did the legislature do this session to address that issue? Well, we continued on our pathway there, too. The, um, the governor and the legislature have both been uh, quite purposeful in the last two budgets, uh, adding more money to the mental health system. Philosophically, we had begun to turn a corner that we wanted to recognize that, that Washington State had a much higher number of people in mental health hospitals than any other state in the country. So... We needed to turn the corner and start establishing some community-based care models across the state of Washington. So that's where we were heading, and then we got the court decision about overcrowding at Western State. And what was the overcrowding coming from? It was coming from prosecutors charging people with crimes who had a mental health problem. Well, mental health was growing. I mean, mental health problems were increasing. More crimes were increasing. And those folks needed to ha have the assessment done of whether or not they could uh, have the mental capacity 
to stand trial and be part of their own defense. And so that assessment process was driving people into hospitals, into the mental health hospitals. And uh, then after the assessment, there had to be some sort of treatment provided so that the person's skill sets were reconstructed. So they were, they were now capable of uh, participating in their own defense. So we had pretty much this plan to go towards the community-based model. And then there was this urgency that the court created and also our hospitals created because they, they couldn't hold these people in a hospital setting for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, and so that became then the model that we had to address this forensic situation. And, but we still could have the opportunity to have these civil programs existing around the community. So that's where you saw the increases uh, this year. We're, to, uh, we're not gonna be closing down Western State but we are on a pathway now to shifting to an entirely forensic model at Western State. And we're going to be building up uh, community-based systems across the state. Right. So 16 bed facilities in any major area uh, of the state. So, I mean, imagine the situation. You're from Bellingham. Uh, you're, you know, your mother or your father is living in Bellingham. Uh, you know, and you have to come down to Western State for... 60, 90 days, 180 days during a forensics evaluation process if you commit a crime and you're, and you're not capable of, of, of uh, participating in your own defense. So we think that the community-based model is going to be uh, in, more in tune with what the rest of the country has done. All right. So it, it, did you get all the way there, or is there some fine tuning? Well, there's six that's new, to six new um, hospitals that are going to be smaller hospitals that are going to be built around the state and many, many uh, more uh, along the whole continuum of detox to um, uh, you know, s some sort of uh, urgent care and then uh, more um, community settings where people can get the kind of, of uh, intensive treatment that they need to then go out and be able to live in the community again and get outpatient treatment. Okay. Another big issue that came up during this session, which we're going to have to talk about, uh, was the D Public Disclosure Act. Yes. Um, and now this is something, as a city employee, uh, I respond to public records requests uh, as most city employees, um, city council members. Every city, every county, every other government body in the state does. Legislature has not, till to date, done that. Um, and there was a superior court ruling that said uh, that the law does apply to the legislature. And then the legislature, I'm not surprised that the legislature could act fast. I've seen the legislature act very fast in the past over my 27 years. Um, so the fact that you acted fast didn't surprise me because um, I know you can do it. Um, but some people were stunned that the legislature took some actions which were widely interpreted incorrectly uh, th that you had gutted the Public Disclosure Act. So I'm going to give you a chance to talk about what you really did before I ask you some more questions. Well, I've had many opportunities <laughs> in the two weeks that I've been back in the community uh, to, to talk about this issue. And um, I, I basically ask people two questions, if I can remember what they are right now. But the first question is, did you always think that the legislature was covered by the Public Disclosure Act? Did you think that it was covered? Oh, me? The, I, the, answer, I yes. the answer always was yes. Oh, okay. Yes, well, of course you were covered. And I said, would it surprise you to know that the bill we passed actually addressed the fact that we had not been covered by the Public Disclosure Act, but we were willing to be covered in certain ways? Um, no, what does that mean? You know. And so it's basically been explaining, I've been doing a lot of explaining about... Uh, about how that bill was constructed, what we'd had in the past, what we, what the court uh, interpretation was, and how we expected to go forward. Um, so it was a big brouhaha, no, no question about that. It was widely misinterpreted, and um, so our, my concerns as a legislator were about two particular elements of this. One that it, the the court appears to have interpreted that all 147 legislators are independent agencies of government. Hmm. 
and that as an independent agency of government, let's say the Department of Corrections is an independent agency of government, let's say the 19,000 people that work at DSHS, they're an agency of government. City but of Tacoma. City of Tacoma, you know, yeah. you, are, you are more than one. Right. I am one person. So uh, one of the, the um, actions required in the Public Disclosure Act is that the agency, as it's defined, the agency, shall have it, one designated person that spends a minimum of 30 hours per week addressing public disclosure requests. Well, I am one person mm -hmm. that is a part-time person. I'm a part-time citizen legislator. And I don't spend 30 hours a week, typically every week on the job right now. And if I was to be determined that I was a public disclosure act uh, if I, if I was an agency, then I was to fully comply, then I would need to be working on Public Disclosure Act related issues 30 hours a week. So well, I think that takes away from, from what I was elected to do. So and it can't be your staff, because you do have like staff. I have staff, staff, but yeah. It has to be you, not the staff. It has to be, they're not in my agency. Oh. Okay. I don't pay them. The state pays them. The state pays them. I see, okay. And um, the state doesn't pay them through, I don't have a budget a personal budget as a legislator. So, I mean, I would have had no problem if the court had determined that the legislature was an agency or that the Senate was an agency and the House of Representatives was an agency. But it's incomprehensible to me that I would be expected to do every single bit of that. I mean, I don't own the copy machine, and yet I would be re required to do redacting and to copy, make copies. Well, how, how is that? I mean, how is it possible that we would be determined to be independent agencies? But that was the interpretation of the court. Okay. The second part of that that concerns me is that the, um, the Public Disclosure Act actually requires um, a lot of documents to be open, including your calendar. And so I am concerned because the nature of my work includes working with constituents in Tacoma, some of whom are, who are facing extremely dire times, uh, who are in dangerous situations. And quite frankly, I don't want to say, I'm going to be having a meeting with XYZ constituent at XYZ coffee house in Tacoma, Washington. Um, I don't want people to know that. Uh, I think it's unfair to the people that I'm meeting with. Uh, I don't want to have to start having meetings in my home um, so that I could provide Safety. I don't even know how I could I would do that with someone. So I don't want to deter people from making appointments to meet with me about sensitive topics, and I don't want to put anybody at risk. And quite frankly, I, I you know I don't want to put myself at risk. There's some places I don't want to tell people where I'm going to be. Right. I think that that's a fairly reasonable, uh, given the kind of nature that you do with constituents. I mean, you meet with lobbyists, which, like me, I mean, it's it, that's a little different thing. I don't. Oh yeah, that's that's. Not, I have no problem. I have to report that that you know that that I met with you. So you have to report that yeah. you met with me. I, I don't have a problem with that. No. Uh, but I'm not asking you for a constituent service, even though I live in your district. If I were to call you and say I'm having this real big problem uh, over with something, uh, that might be a little different situation. I can certainly see that uh, being uh, something that's reasonably uh, expected to, to be not a public record. And, but if you're an agency, you've got to spend the time redacting that public record or making the determination that that's not a record that is susceptible uh, to, right. to, be, to recollection. That's right. So, so, so that didn't get to your first question, because it was, it was a brouhaha, no, yeah. no question. Uh, we did pass these bills that would have required more of us than we've ever had to do before, uh, but kept some of those, those things uh, sacrosanct, uh, at least at this point in time. And we did pass that on a bipartisan way with a supermajority in both the House and the Senate. Uh, the bill did go to the governor, and of course, the speed that it that happened, uh, the fact that there weren't public hearings on it, the fact that it was written by our lawyers without public input, um, was of concern to everyone's constituents. So uh, everyone took a lot of calls, we took, we read a lot of emails, we got a lot of hot, hotline reports. Um, so it was, a, it was a big concern and there was a big push on the governor to veto the bill. 
uh, even though it, it had been uh, given to him with a veto-proof uh, vote. There was certainly uh, a different level of concern by all the members and uh, um, realizing that were the vote to be taken again, we would not have that supermajority. So we did ask the governor to veto the bill um, and we'll let the court process now determine what's going to be required of us. Now, the, 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 the ruling by the Supreme Court judge has been stayed mm -hmm. and pending an appeal. And, and there, isn't there some negotiations that are supposed to occur between the press, whatever that is, and, uh, and the state uh, on a way forward or an approach to take to the Supreme Court? I, I, uh, I really, um, I'm a little numb about <laughs> the rest of the process, <laughs> okay. to tell you the truth, Andy. Randy, it, it uh, you know, it was clear that we, we moved away from, you know, stepped back from the cliff. You know, we, we moved away from, from, uh, from the, the problem because we had so much community concern about it. Um, yeah. I, I mean, it, there was some, it was a fascinating period of a few days to watch. Uh, again, like I said, I've seen the legislature act very rapidly uh, when it needed to. And I, so I was not surprised at all that that can happen. It, it, it can happen. Um, I was also uh, a little dismayed as a former reporter to hear a lot of reporters, uh, people tweeting and Facebooking about the legislature having gutted or somehow decimated the Public Records Act. Well, you know, every every year That's we not have what bills. We have bills that address the public records, uh, uh, and we had them again this session yeah. about victims of certain kinds of crimes, right. about certain kinds of, of uh, public employees, and and whether or not their records would be open to the public. Um, we uh, we I tried to to uh, get a bill through uh, that would have addressed. The voter registration records about your birth date as a as a, a, a voter um, to protect your, your you from identity theft, you know. So there were there always are bills to address the the PDA carving out little ways to tweak it so that more people were protected. Uh, but uh, we had so much more to do this this session, Randy. That I, you know, the speed to which that went through and the speed to which it, it died uh, were were really in part because we needed to move on to other issues. And so whether we were securing a woman's right to, to choose in this state or, or expanding access to higher education or uh, working on environmental issues in my committee, working on juvenile justice reform, we passed massive ju juvenile justice reform measures this year. Uh, there were so many issues, 19,000 jobs, we need to get, get that capital budget passed, uh, you know, McCleary, mental health, a lot of other things in the budget. We we rolled back the clock and actually provide support now for for people with who need our entitlement programs in the state back to our 2008 level and even a little bit better than that. So we're really trying to address families and people that have needs in our state, and we could not just continue to be mired in uh, that that particular discussion. So. We were back at the at the table working on really important issues at that point, putting people first. Right, and, and there's no question. I mean, there was a lot of bills passed that dealt with a whole variety of topics, and and all done in 60 days, which is how government's supposed to work. I want to spend a little time on on the fact that a number of those issues uh, bills dealt with um, voting uh, and voting registration. Uh -huh. uh, and the uh, governor kind of bunched them all together and had one big signing yes. ceremony on it. But the uh, there were things like the Voting Rights Act, which has been mm -hmm. pending for some period of time, um, and which Tacoma has actively supported over over the years. Finally, passing uh, there was uh, you know instant voter registration and a variety of other things. Washington seemed to be going uh, a different direction than uh, some states other well elsewhere in the country who have been making it harder for people to mm -hmm. register to vote and to and to actually vote. Absolutely, um, we took a whack again at all these. Nothing was new about any of the bills we brought forward this year on voting rights access. Um, we've been working on those issues for years. In fact, I prime sponsored. Uh, a couple of those issues when I was still a House member. So uh, not new issues, a lot of debate over the years, a lot of community input. And um, I've been able to see firsthand the work of our auditor who um, was very purposeful about making sure that young people knew at the age of 18 that they could register to vote. And I went with her to Stadium High School. We spent a lunch hour up there um, registering vote, uh, teens. Uh, 
up at Stadium High School. You know, so it was. Uh, uh, I think it's 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 a, a story around the country that's very different. Where uh, whether it's gerrymandering, and we're looking ahead now at, at our redistricting process, and uh, the Supreme Court's weighing in now about gerrymandering, and um, you know, you know, they're not going to take up an issue in in Pennsylvania that was going to hold on to these very wildly configured uh, districts uh, that were meant uh, to restrict people's voting and to uh, restrict their access to more than one party. So um, anyway, we, we are seeing, I think, a, a, a great new uh, vista for uh, the ability of people in our, in our state to vote. You know, it took me nine years to get the voting rights restored for former, formerly convicted felons. And uh, the rest of the country is actually tightening down on some of those issues with former felons being able to vote. So we, we have established, I think, some uh, real recognition that uh, we had some access problems in our state and we're trying to open up the voting uh, to all people who have the right to vote. All right. Well, it was a very productive session, and I just, uh, we are out of time. But uh, it was, it was just about as fast as your 60-day session, wasn't it? <laughs> it was just went that quick. But thank you for being here. Congratulations on a successful legislative session. Thank and you. for getting some time off. You don't have to run for re-election, and Not you sure. um, don't have anything to do for the rest of the year now. <laughs> Right? <laughs> untrue, untrue. Okay, okay. Being chair means I have an interim plan. We're going to be ah. visiting a lot of prisons. That'll be starting off. Okay. All right. Well, thank you again for being here. Thank you. Our guest has been State Senator Jeannie Darneal. We look forward to seeing you next time here on Inside Tacoma.